and came, came and went. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Okay, so I, I I didn't quite hear what you were saying there. So Sorry, yes, I was just uh, giving, I was doing your introduction there, Brian, to everybody. So I, I just started recording. So if you want to work away. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah, perfect, perfect, excellent. And um, I'll do that then. So, so um, all right. hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, it's very nice to, 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 to see such a group of people gathered here together on, on a Thursday evening. Um, first of all, I have to say that it's an absolute honor to be asked to do this. Um, I really am genuinely, truly humbled um, to have the opportunity to, 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 to do this. Uh, secondly, I want to congratulate uh, Cara and, and, and all at the Kerry Writers Museum on, on 20 years. It's a fantastic achievement. And I think if the last year and a bit have, have kind of taught us anything, it's kind of the importance of culture in our lives. Um, and, and it's gotten us all through some very, very tough times. And what, what Cara is doing there is a fantastic resource. Um, you can revisit the old authors, but also inspire the new. Um, so yeah, some of you may know me. Um, I'll introduce myself. And uh, let me just, okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Brian. I, I grew up in Lizelton. Um, so for me, uh, John B was always a figure kind of on my own personal cultural landscape um, from kind of seeing him on the Late Late Show, having everybody in stitches uh, or walking into the bar as a youngster with my parents and seeing like the man from the telly inside in the bar. Um, so he was always a figure that was kind of there for me. Uh, my own journey to kind of John B academically, um, it began when I returned to college as a mature student. Now, John B has said that it is no good trying to analyze a carryman. When cornered, he will change his gait to generate confusion, and you have as much chance of getting a straight answer from him as you have of getting a goose egg from an arctic tern. Nevertheless, I persevered. The more I studied, the more I noticed a kind of an incongruence in the literature written on Keane. He's one of Ireland's most popular and prolific writers, but yet there was very little written about him academically. Uh, maybe John B. was right. Maybe it was no good trying to analyse a curryman. But nevertheless, I persevered. <laughs> um, eventually, I managed to put a book, a book together uh, about him and his most famous, famous play, The Field, which I will draw from a little tonight. Um, I'm going to begin by offering a very short biography of Keane, and I'm going to highlight the influence of change on him. I'm going to follow up with, on this by examining some of his female characters and how they dramatise change itself. Then I'm going to look at reflections of change as seen in Keane's best known work, The Field, and I'm going to finish off by examining the raw humanity that may be more easily seen in the claustrophobia of the provincial setting. I'm going to intersperse some video clips so you all get a break from listening to me and you get to listen to the man himself. So to begin with, uh, John B was born on 21st of July in 1928 in Church Street in the Stone, County Kerry. Son to a national school teacher, William Keane and his wife, Hannah. Keane was undoubtedly influenced by his father's love of books who had created a library of sorts in the house. Keane would later say of his father, my father was a schoolmaster and he never imposed. I see now how very lucky I was to be born under the broad influences of this penniless but far reaching instructor. As a youth, Keane spent his summers in the Stax Mountains with his cousins, the Sheehys. During, during these summers, Keane was brought into contact with a world where the old traditions were alive as opposed to Keane's uh, native Listowel, which was in a state of relative modernization. Um, this is like, I just chose this photograph because I think it represents it quite well. Uh, you have John B sitting on the shiny new mini, whereas in the background you have the ass and cart. Um, so this kind of shows this kind of duality of existence that was going on, the kind of the old ways and, and, and a more modern version. Um, the Sheehy's homestead also served as a rambling house where folk stories were exchanged and songs were sang. In a personal interview that I conducted with Keane's wife, Mary, in 2012, she told me that going there was better than going to college. He learned about human beings and the way people live there and live there happy. Therefore, Keane, from a young age, was influenced not only by a modernizing culture in his native Listowel, 
but also by the rural culture he experienced and loved in the stacks. According to Brendan Kennelly, Keane's time in the stacks opened his eyes to an elemental, almost pagan way of life and instilled in him an appreciation of nature and the natural. Kennelly states, I would say that he was opened up there in the stacks to paganism and Christianity interlocked. Keane's ability to negotiate between the realms of the catechism inscribed since youth and the natural, almost pagan world sets him apart as a writer, according to Kennelly. Kennelly states, our struggle is to return to the primordial freshness that created us in the first place. Keane has that kind of drive. He has that drive to be utterly natural. It's in Rousseau. It's in Pat. It comes easy to Keane. In 1951, Keane met his future wife, Mary. Having decided that his prospects in the pharmacy trade were not good, he made the difficult decision to go to England in order to provide some sort of a future for himself and Mary. On the 6th of January, 1952, Keane left Listowel bound for the factory of British Timken in Northampton, where he worked as a furnace operator in a steel factory. While in Northampton, Keane began writing poems and stories, one of which was published in the Irish press. He then began working on a novel. Keane himself admitted, I started writing out of desperation if I hadn't, I'd have gone mad. However, certain liberal aspects of life in England appeal to Keane. Having come from a country where book censorship was rife and where he was angered by narrow social attitudes and the vice-like grip the church had on the people, England was an escape. Keane stated, at times I felt imprisoned in my mind and I think now that it was one of the reasons I took the boat to England. In England, Keane had experienced a world free from the claustrophobia induced by the church and social myopia. And this taste of freedom would have a massive influence on his work. In England, Keane was one of the emigrant Irish, many of whom had little education. This was due to the combination of their poor Irish language skills and the fact that classes in schools in Ireland were conducted through Irish. Uh, this undoubtedly influenced his later involvement in the language freedom movement a movement against the compulsory teaching of Irish language in schools. And Keane, due to his high profile, he became a figurehead for the movement. At a time of nationalistic fervor, this movement went completely against the grain. Referring to a particularly eventful uh, LFM gathering, Martin Reynolds, one of the stewards stated, for the revivalists, it was a turning point, for we had questioned the whole concept of nationality. We were denying that an ability to speak Irish was equivalent to being a patriot. According to Keane's wife, Mary, again, in an interview I conducted with her in 2012, what had triggered his interest in such a movement was all the people he knew that emigrated without any bit of schooling at all, due to the educational system being too much through Irish. And Keane felt that if they could just learn the Irish language themselves for their own entertainment and joy, it would be better than having it rammed down their throat. While in Northampton, Keane applied for, and was successful in securing, a position as a chemist assistant in Donrail, County Cork, and he returned for good to Ireland in 1954. However, Keane still longed to be at home in Listowel, and when an opportunity arose with his former employer, Keane Stack, uh, he grabbed it with both hands. He then proposed to Mary, who duly accepted, and at around this time, the Greyhound Bar was advertised for sale in Listowel. Keane put in a successful bid for it. Now a publican, he began to write late at night. The pub and its various characters provided endless inspiration for Keane, as he admitted himself. He said, I could not help seeing some of them as characters for a play. I encourage them to sing and recite and tell stories. This has been put more succinctly in an often related anecdote, where Keane was approached by an old customer of his who said to him, John B., you're the smartest of us all, who takes down what we says and who charges us to read it. And where better, to paraphrase Pat Spokok, to watch the face of the country changing from the social, than from the social refuge of a warm bar on a wet winter's evening. And the rest, as they say, is history. Okay, now I'm going to move on and talk about some of John B's female characters. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to give you all a break from listening to me and show you a short clip of John B in full flight. As we look at this, I would like you to bear in mind 
an observation made by a lady called Cheryl Temple Her, who was writing about the, the field in, in, in a series of books called Ireland into Film. And she described John P as always applying a comic salve to the hearts that he probes. I think this is an incredibly astute observation by her. Um, so I'm going to play a video, a, a short video clip, and uh, hopefully this is all going to work. Modern technology. And just bear in mind that this is John B applying a comic salve to the hearts that he probes. I hope everybody can see this and hear this. A married man, John B. Um, do you you must ooze wisdom about marriage and, and love and all that, do you? Marriage, I'll tell you about marriage. <laughs> <laughs> in, in very briefly, there's marriage on the surface in many instances looks marvellous, but it isn't so marvellous at all, because there's many an Irishman who can mingle, you know, the safe delights of matrimony with the perilous prudence of infidelity. And, oddly enough, be ultimately, you know, honoured with a highly favourable matri card. In other words, he's getting a pat on the back for what he's doing. Yes. That's the sort of society we live in. Yes. And there's a line in Big, Big Maggie where she said, you know, there's enough lies written in the headstones of Ireland without my adding to them. <laughs> but I myself have known fellas who died, you know, scoundrels, far worse than I am even. And there will be marvellous verse written to them in the matter he can't. Yes. Just where he was a saint, that he was a, a subject for canonisation. <laughs> Whereas all his life he, he, he murdered his family. Yes. This is, I'm talking now about exceptions. But marriage to survive, uh, you must, you must recognise it as, as a confrontation, a non-going war between two people with shocked outbreaks of peace in between. <laughs> and the, the, the biggest threat that I can see to marriage is sort of outside issues. Like marriage is a game for two. Uh, it doesn't need a free, it doesn't need linesmen. The minute the ball is thrown in, let the two at it. <laughs> and let him finish out the game and till such time as the man above blows his whistle and calls one of them off to the side then. <laughs> then, then the remaining partner is free to start another game. <laughs> so the game goes on. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so I think um, in, ter in terms of uh, his applying a comic salve to the hearse that he probes, I think it's, it's quite obvious there. Um, one second now. Um, so we have we have John B there like uh, discussing kind of so some very dysfunctional relationships, but then wrapping it up with some very amusing anecdotes at the end, which is exactly what he does. Um, okay, now let me just get back here. Okay, so to move on, um, at first glance, the work of John B. Uh, may be seen as belonging to the past and somewhat irrelevant to the Ireland of today. But his plays dramatise the conflict between the individual and a continually constricting social order, a conflict that is both timeless and relevant. In terms of his female characters, the actress and theatre producer Phyllis Ryan notes that Keane has not created one-dimensional wicked witch puppets he has written about human beings who have survived in situations involving hard work, no play, and nothing much in the way of marital satisfaction. The meaning of love has been driven from their understanding by years of hard usage. In this context, Keane's writing documented and challenged the status quo of gender politics in rural Ireland through his representations of strong female characters at odds with their surroundings. Through these representations, Keane also gave voice to female anxieties regarding the role of their gender in Irish society. And in essence, Keane's female characters embody and give voice to a female struggle for recognition, identity, and equality in a society that continually seeks to reduce and define. And Keane represents these anxieties on stage through his subversion of the stereotypical rural Irish female. These are issues that still hold relevance today. 
In a recent podcasted interview for the Irish Times, renowned theatre director Gary Hines was asked about the current issue of the lack of female representation in the Abbey Theatre's 2016 programme, celebrating the centenary of 1916. Hines replied that the lack of representation of women is ground deeply within our culture and is ground within ourselves. It is precisely these static notions that are ground deep within ourselves that Keane explores in his works. And his representations and subversion of such static notions on stage will now be explored in four of his female characters, two of which appear in his first major play, Scythe. Um, I was just checking, there was a message in the chat. Um, all right, uh, so Sive. okay, let's talk about Sive. Um, first performed in 1959, Sive focuses on the Glavin household and the main dramatic impetus comes from the actions of the character of Nina, described in the opening stage directions as well-proportioned, hard-featured person in her early 40s. She is Mina, wife of the man of the house. From this opening description, two things may be surmised. Firstly, though Mina is well proportioned, she is also hard featured. Thus, any traditional idealized concepts of feminine beauty are immediately subverted by the realities and lived experience of existence. Secondly, Mina is described as the wife of the man of the house, indicating her position in the social order of the Glavin household, and by extension, that of the position of the female within rural Irish society. Central to the play is a discourse on the place of woman within society and the necessity for change. The character of Sive, on the other hand, is introduced to us as a pretty girl, aged about 18, wearing a grey tweed coat, which is a little too small for her, carrying a satchel filled with books. She is immediately contrasted with the character of Mina not only through her youthful beauty, but also due to the presence of her book-filled satchel, as in the 1950s, staying at school beyond the age of 14 was very much not a social norm. It could be said that Sive has not only outgrown her grey tweed coat, but also her surroundings. Such divergence from traditional social norms is highlighted by Amina when she informs Sive that it is out working with a farmer, you should be my girl, instead of getting your head filled with high notions. From Mina's viewpoint, Sive, being illegitimate, has little prospects in the tradition of marrying into land, her only possible future in Mina's eyes, and uses this as justification for matching her with the elderly Sean Dota. However, Mina is also a product of her environment, having experienced poverty from which the only escape under traditional values was marriage. It may be argued that she wants to secure some form of a future for the illegitimate side, one that is better than the match than the match I made, four cows on the side of a mountain and a few acres of bog. From her actions, it is apparent that Mina imagines no, Mina imagines no future for her gender outside of being the wife of the man of the house and imposes that view upon Sive, who embodies a far more progressive view of the future role of her gender one rooted in education. Mina is also seeking authority within her own household, ironically utilizing the old tradition of matchmaking to manifest her own interpretation of progress. She posits this desire as part of her argument for the match to Sive. She tells her that every woman will come to the age when she will have mind for a room of her own a line incredibly reminiscent of Virginia Woolf's 1929 publication where issues of female education, financial security and independence are foregrounded. It is also of note that the character of Sive, the representation of progress in the text, is denied agency and unable to locate herself within her static surroundings, tragically takes her own life in the ultimate rejection of traditional inertia. Further revealing in terms of stagnating gender roles, Keen's critical eye and the necessity of change. In Keen's 1965 work, The Field, we are introduced to Mamie as being public in Mick Flanagan's wife. And in her opening line of the play, she informs her husband that your dinner is ready. From the outset, like Mina Glavin, Mamie is placed within tradi the traditional female role of domesticity, catering for the man of the house. 
All but two scenes of the play take place within Flanagan's Bar. Thus, Mamie's role within this dualistic location, which is both a public house and a private sphere, is of central significance. Though positioned in a traditional familial role, Mamie also exhibits rebellious tendencies towards the submissive and sacrificial elements of that role. She orders Mick not to turn on the radio while eating as the baby's asleep. If he wakes, that's the end of my hairdo. And when he complains of the lack of variety in eating corned beef and cabbage again, she adopts a mocking tone. What do you expect, turkey and ham? So we see from Mamie's opening lines of the play, she occupies the traditional space of woman of the house, mother of nine children. But through her words and actions, she also challenges the stereotype of the submissive sacrificing wife and mother. As I mentioned, as this ambiguity is located in a bar, a space that is a simultaneously a private and a public sphere, the public performance of gender may be contrasted with the private realities of it. We get a glimpse of Mamie's private reality in her account of bringing a few of the boys in for a drink after attending a dance while her husband was supposed to be spending the night in Dublin. However, her husband, having come, on, come home early, has listened to everything going on in the bar in seclusion at the top of the stairs. He subsequently confronts Mamie, strikes her and knocks her down the stairs. Though this passage is cloaked in humour in the play, Mamie is directly referring to physical abuse at the hands of her husband, a reality endured by many within the private sphere of domestic living in the 1960s. This is reflected in a 1997 study by McKiernan and McWilliams, which was entitled Women, Religion and Violence in the Family. They state, domestic violence was left untouched and protected by church and state as part of the private sphere of family life. Victims had relatively few rights until the mid 1970s. In essence, Mamie embodies a female struggle for recognition, identity and equality. And she represents these issues on stage through her subversion of the stereotypical rural Irish female. These are issues that still hold relevance today. And it may be argued that for present day audiences, Mamie is a character representative of both past and present inequalities and anxieties. She may be seen as rebelling against her gendered subordination to her challenging the dominant males of Carrie Tolman. Remember, she is one of the few characters that actually challenges the Bull McCabe in the field. But also through her suggested promiscuity, which could be seen as, according to Phyllis Ryan, her only form of protest against an unbearable existence. Her position within and her ultimate reluctant acceptance of traditional rural Irish society in order to survive there makes her a somewhat ambivalent character. And it is in this ambivalence that gender anxieties, which are a product of her own raw humanity, are to be found. As the American academic Murray Huber Keeley asserts, he manages to create both a nostalgia for the banishing traditions with their secure social niches and a sympathy for the men and women trapped by those same traditions. Now, I would like to address another of Keane's female characters that occupies an ambivalent space in relation to traditional stereotypical gender roles, and that is the character of Big Maggie Palpin. Okay, in 1969's Big Maggie, we first meet Maggie Palpin feeling little remorse at the burial of her heavy drinking and philandering husband. Asked if she would like to add anything to the inscription on her husband's headstone, she replies, there's enough lies written on the headstones of Ireland without my adding to them. Like Mina Glavin in Sive, Maggie is also a product of her past, having lived in a loveless marriage, one where she married him for the security. In the opening scene, Maggie's presented as both a hardened woman and a product of her environment, marrying into an unhappy, marri unhappy and sexless marriage with a serial adulterer in order to survive in the world around her. Following her husband's death, Maggie assumes control of the family. Now a liberated force, she assumes a position of authority previously denied to her. She exercises this authority over her children, controlling their futures and limiting their freedom. Superficially, this may be seen as simply replicating the subjugation she endured previously. However, this would only scratch the surface of her character. Yes, she denies the farm to Nick. She refuses permission to Morris to marry. She force, forces Kate into a marriage and undermines Gert by making a move on her love interest. 
However, when explored further, Maggie's actions, though harsh, arise from what Maggie describes as the hardness of concern. Always remember that about me. Though she may appear harsh and unloving, it may be argued that she is acting in what she perceives as the best interests of her children. Through her actions, Maggie believes that she is teaching her children the importance of independence and self-respect, lessons she learned herself through the hardship of her own experience. Therefore, Maggie's hardness of concern expressed through her actions may be seen as an effort to spare her children the same fate that she herself suffered. Uh, sorry, this, this, the chat uh, is going off there. Uh, so like Mina in Sive uh, and Mamie in the field, Maggie may be seen to personify an ambivalent relationship with tradition and change, one reflective of a changing female social landscape. She has been both a prisoner of tradition and through her treatment of her daughters, an advocate of, her, of its value. Her actions as asserted by Keeley they reflect both her certitude about traditional values and her criticisms of the norms that have enslaved her. Maggie's most scathing criticism of dominant social norms come in the altered ending of the Ben Barnes 1988 production of the play. Left alone, having driven three of her children to England and forced the remaining one into marriage, Maggie closes the play in soliloquy. Her final speech charts an awakening sexuality one that has laid dormant due to the stifling, smothering breath of the religion that withered my loving and my living and my womanhood. In this soliloquy, Maggie voices a new interpretation of womanhood as a powerful sexual being. Her final words present a woman reborn, free from the Catholic guilt prescribed to her gender. By God, I can have any man in Ireland if there's a man I fancy who fancies me. There's still time to fulfill myself. From now on, I'll confess my fantasies to a lusty, lanky man with muscle, a man bringing, brimming with sap and tapsy, a man who'll be a real match for big Maggie Palpin. The wheel of the chastity card is still around my belly and the incense is in my nostrils. I'm too long a prisoner, but I'll savor what I can while I can and let the last hour be the sorest. Having looked at some of Keane's female characters and the social context surrounding them, it may be said that his represent, representations of women often feature very strong women who challenge their position within society and embody change itself. This is a point echoed again by Phyllis Ryan, who stated, long before the term women's lib became a catch cry for female frustrations, John B. Keane was writing plays featuring tough women with rebellious tendencies. Keane's writing documented and challenged the status quo of gender politics in rural Ireland through his representations of strong female characters at odds with their surroundings. And it is in their negotiation of traditional society and their manifestation of change that the humanity of their situation is laid bare. Again, I'll go back to Marie Hubert Keeley. Uh, in, in her words, each of his female characters draws on the traditional roles of Irish women. And each demonstrates in some way the failure of the stereotype to portray adequately the genuine concerns and the struggles of individuals within the social system. And this is something that doesn't just apply to, to Keane's women. This is something that you could apply to most of John Dee's characters, the individual versus the social system. Uh, I would like to move on. And I would look, like to look at context of change in John B.'s most celebrated play, The Field. Um, so socially, politically, and economically, the time of The Field's creation was one of great change. To reference Gabriel Fitzmaurice's sonnet in memoriam John B. Keane, the Ireland of Keane's writing was indeed changing as he wrote. Ireland, having been formally declared a republic in 1949, remained a mainly agricultural society throughout the 40s and the 50s. And according to Declan Kybert, rural Ireland remained a deeply conservative patriarchal society, protective in its embrace of children, but harshly impatient with those who stepped out of line, especially if embroiled in a sexual misadventure. Matchmaking, as seen in Keane's Sive, was still a common practice, 
and was done for reasons that echoed the revivalist obsession with land ownership, that is, protection from the subdivision of farmland. However, around this time, many women made the move to England and trained as nurses and teachers in order to escape being married off to some elderly farmer. Due to mass immigration and such arranged marriages, Ireland was very much at odds with the ideology of idyllic pastoralism and family life enshrined in De Valera's constitution of 1937. According to Roy Foster, De Valera's vision of Ireland, repeated in numerous formulations, was of small agricultural units, each self-sufficiently supporting a frugal family, industrious, gaelicist, and anti-materialist. His ideal, like the popular literary versions, was built on the basis of a fundamentally dignified and ancient peasant way of life. However, such a vision was failing a rural Irish population, and for the most part, ignoring an urban, pop urban population in the process of attempting to decolonize the nation. According to Declan Kybert, life on the land was Spartan. Few farms had been truly mechanized, and the exploitation of the soil for cash crops remained lethargic. Younger sons had no option but to pursue an emigrant career elsewhere. They were regularly joined in their exile by small farmers whose units were no longer economical. Rural Ireland was filled with broken families whose fate seemed quite at variance with the official ideology enshrined in De Valera's 37 constitution of a society which constructed itself on the sacredness of family life. In response to this mass unemployment and immigration, the economic expansion of the 1960s, engineered by T.K. Whitaker and Sean Lamass, was changing the landscape of a traditional agricultural society, as both men committed themselves to long-term economic planning for an industrialized Ireland. In the words of Whitaker, the then Secretary of the, Department of, of the Department of Finance, it was recognized that reliance on a shrinking home market offered no prospect of satisfying Ireland's employment aspirations, and that protectionism, both in agriculture and in industry, would have to give way to active competitive participation in a fully trading world. The ideological implications inherent in Whitaker's program were vast and would challenge the entire notion of Irish identity in their implementation. Terence Brown notes, an Ireland that had espoused nationalism for a quarter of a century and employed manifold tariffs in the interests of native industry was to open its economy to as much foreign investment as could be attracted by government inducement. Furthermore, an Ireland that had sought to define its identity since independence, principally in terms of social patterns rooted in the country's past, was to seek to adapt itself to the prevailing capitalist values of the developed world. Thus, in terms of Irish identity, the somewhat insular pastoralism of De Valera's 1943 radio address titled On Language and the Irish Nation, in which he spoke of the laughter of happy maidens and a countryside bright with cozy homesteads, was being challenged and replaced by a vision of Irish identity that looked outside of itself, towards foreign investment, towards Europe, and sought to define itself not by its past, but by its future. It is also noteworthy that the late 1950s saw the emergence into positions of power and influence of men who had been born since independence, suggesting that the new regime in Ireland did not have as much post-revolution baggage as their predecessors. Thus, perhaps Ireland was no longer mired in terms of identity in the Gaelicism, protectionism, and reverence of the past that was infused by de Valera, but instead, as mentioned above, could look outward towards external influence and towards the future itself. The adventure, adventurous policies of economic renewal espoused by Whitaker and Lamas would prove successful. In the 1960s, through attractive government incentives, Ireland would experience relative prosperity due to foreign investment in industry, as the land of saints and scholars increasingly became an island of silos and silicone. Such was the level of change in the 1960s that the pace of modernization astonished many and no area of Irish life was left untouched. Between 1960 and 1969, over 300 manufacturing enterprises came from overseas to take advantage of the attractive terms offered by the government. And that's according to Declan Kybert. So how are these changes reflected in the field? Well, um, as mentioned in relation to Gabriel Fitzmaurice's sonnets, this new Ireland 
It did indeed hold that Keane's writing was of Ireland past. For many, Keane was merely considered a country boy, achieving popular success at the time, but not becoming a critical success until recent years, which in itself may be symptomatic of modern, modern Ireland's dismissal of its heritage while, while drunk on the perfume of a new industrial, economically prosperous Irish identity. While superficially, his work may appear to be marred in the past, on closer study, the universal universality of his themes, the timeless things from the primal heart, again, to quote Gabriel's sonnet, would repudiate such an errant reading of his work. It may be argued that Keane belonged to both worlds of Ireland, past and new, and it is through his negotiation of both of these worlds that a subtle critique of both realms is offered. The conflict between all Ireland and its modernization finds its expression in the field, most obviously in the character of the Bull McCabe. McCabe is a tragic figure, as described by Fenton O'Toole, who defines tragedy as occurring when there are two worlds, morally, ethically, socially, culturally. There are two ways of understanding the world, two human frameworks, two sets of terms of reference for how we should live, which have equal weight and which therefore trap people within the no man's land or no woman's land between the two of them. McCabe is indeed trapped within two human frameworks, two sets of reference for how we should live. On the one hand, McCabe lives elementally and instinctually. He has a primal, almost pagan relationship with the land, and due to his working the land in question, feels entitled to it through an unwritten law of the land, which forms part of old Ireland's unconscious constitution. He tells the barman and the auctioneer Mick Flanagan that twas our sweat that fenced it and our dung that manured it. Thus, twould give me as much claim to the field as the woman who has it up for sale. However, McCabe is met with the irresistible force of a change in Ireland in the character of William D, who is referred to by McCabe as some hang blasted shagger of a stranger, an imported lam land grabber, a foreign cock with hair oil and tie pin who will do me out of my rights. The fact that Dee is continually referred to as an outsider is of note, as he constitutes part of the emigrant Irish. Having made a success of himself in England and represents a change in Ireland, one that seeks prosperity outside of the country. Thus McCabe is caught in this no man's land as his primal mode of existence is threatened by a changing rural landscape and he commits the ultimate revenge by killing, albeit accidentally, the representation of a new industrial Ireland, one that contains a death sentence for the praxis of McCabe's world. The field may be seen to represent the battleground where tradition and heritage clash with a vision of Ireland that refutes traditional rural life. Social, political and economic changes in rural Ireland find expression through the conflict in the play. An example of this is Keane's treatment of the church it is the two main institutions of power that conduct, conduct the investigation into the murder of Dee. That is the law, Sergeant Leahy, and the church, Father Murphy. Now the law is cast as an exteriority to McCabe's community early in the play when it is described as the same law the whole time, the same dirty English law. However, it is the exclusion of the church to the role of outsider that signifies a shift in rural Ireland. No controlling influence is afforded to the church in the field, as neither the priest nor the sergeant can pick the lock of silence in the community regarding Dee's murder. The conflict between community and institution is apparent in McCabe's tirade against the sergeant and the priest. He says, the two of you there have the power behind you. Why isn't it some other man you picked sergeant to go searching with you? You have the law well sewn up, all of you, all neat and tidy to yourselves. The fact that the law is referred to the same law the whole time, the same dirty English law, also hints at Ireland's colonial past and the resulting detachment from and opposition to the colonizer's authority by the native community. The division between church and community becomes more apparent if one looks at the structure of the play. Just two scenes occur outside of the bar, the murder and the bishop's sermon. Thus, as asserted by Keeley, both the murder and the sermon occur outside the villagers' dirty, daily life. Thereby, the spheres of religious belief and moral practice are divided, and moral practice is no longer under the guidance of religion. To separate church and community in rural Ireland in the 1960s was a brave move by Keane. 
one that reflected a changing Ireland at the time of writing, but also foresaw the decline of the power of the church that has occurred in recent years and illustrates Keane's ability to channel changes in, social, in the social context within which he was writing and examine such changes on both personal and collective levels. In the field, the conflict between institution and community is also voiced through the juxtaposition of McCabe's common law of the land against the official laws of state. McCabe's assertion that both the priest and the guard have the law well sewn up, all of you all nice and tidy to yourselves, does not reflect the true image of the law in Carrick Tormund. Uh, McCabe casually omits his own interpretation of the law an interpretation that the entire community submits to and partakes in, in the face of examination by official law. His sense of entitlement to the field being put up for auction by the widow Butler, his sense of historical inheritance through his working of the land and his will to survive, all inform the self-inscribed constitution of what may be called law by McCabe. Ultimately, the community in Carrick Tormund subscribe to McCabe's version of law and provide him with an alibi for the night of the murder. And through their silence when under investigation by the guard and the priest, reject the so-called law of state. Through this, Keane is further dramatizing a discord between institution and community. And ultimately, there is only tragedy to be found in the gulf between the two, as to repeat Fintan O'Toole. Tragedy occurs when there are two competing, equally weighted worldviews presented, and one finds oneself trapped within the no man's land or no woman's land between the two of them. Thus, by dramatizing the conflict between institution and community, Keane deconstructs traditional ideological powerhouses and exposes the injustices and hypocrisies therein. Okay. Um, I would like just to finish off, uh, I know we're kind of coming up on time, uh, just to look at kind of Keane's use of setting and how the provincial setting um, aids an exposition of humanity um, in many ways. And the success and longevity of Keane's plays, which are still performed regularly in both urban and rural theatres, suggests on one level an appreciation of the humour and wit present in them, of which there is plenty. However, on another level, such success indicates an identification being made by the audience with the plays on the levels of theme and character. The drama critic Michael Sheridan makes the point that the universal truths about people can oftentimes be more clearly expressed in the claustrophobia of the provincial setting. Keane's work for the most part interrogates the human condition within an insular parochial environment. And in the form of Keane's traditional rural hour settings, he presents a society paired back to its essentials in order to examine the human condition in its raw state, stripped of its possessions. The, the, this claustrophobia that is enclosed, confining, oppressive and stifling enables an exposition of humanity within the microcosm of the limited human interaction encountered in the provincial setting, thereby illustrating the universal truths about people on an elemental level. The claustrophobia of the provincial setting may be seen in Keynes the Field, with the majority of the action taking place in Flanagan's bar. And there is a familiarity expressed between all of the characters, bar William D. D is cast as an outsider to the familiar and insular world of the residents of Carrick Tormund, and in the end, he pays the ultimate price for not being part of that realm. Both Carrick Tormund and Flanagan's bar, which is the communal space in the village, are sites of enclosure. And by locating his characters in such a confined setting, Keane is presenting a society under examination. The character of Leamy, often the voice of conscience in the, conscience in the play, he falls victim to this sense of enclosure. His continual questioning of the dominant social order within the confined space of Carrick and his desire to be different from them results in his removal from that space, which is attributed on the surface to his being sent away to stay with Mamie's sister in the Midlands, having been diagnosed by the doctor as suffering from his nerves. However, such a challenge to the dominant social order as represented by Leamy cannot exist in an enclosed oppressive space, much as William Dee's challenge to it was quite literally slain. Alternatively, you can take the viewpoint that Leamy was removed from this environment for his own benefit and Mamie was acting from a position of love and hope. Perhaps having seen the inertia bred of enclosure within Carrick Torment, 
and re realizing Limi's incompatibility with it, maybe decides to remove him from such a stifling environment. It may also be argued that the audience, though they may identify with the characters on stage and can relate to the play's thematic content, are also excluded from this provincial enclosed space. And they may observe in quiet objectivity, the workings of a blinkered humanity, enabling an examination of the human condition as presented before them. Through Keane's utilization of the claustrophobia of the provincial setting, the savagery within it may be exposed revealing universal truths of human nature in a very clear and essential manner. Keane's use of this technique also facilitates an interrogation of society at large through its mirroring in a world in miniature. Power forces are at play in Carrick as much as they are in any other part of the world, be it Dublin, Dubai, or Bali de Hob. The raw humanity that Keane interrogates through the claustrophobia of the provincial setting is not always a pretty one but it is an interrogation that Keane foregrounds in his work. And though the Bull McCabe may be seen as a mantras character, on one level, one can identify with his human motiva motivation too. By presenting the workings of flawed and raw humanity laid bare in the provincial setting, Keane is encouraging an interrogation of the human condition and its relationship with society on both collective and personal levels for the audience or the reader. Now, Having looked at the context of change within Keane's own early years within his female characters and as represented in the field, it can be seen that his characters are expressions of individualism against a changing society, a theme that is increasingly relevant today. Um, the drama in his plays comes from a raw humanity that the pair back, paired back rural setting of his plays brings to the fore. I think it would be incredibly interesting to see what drama would be coming from John B regarding current times with society having been turned on its head somewhat. Um, I also have to admit, hands up, that I borrowed the title of this lecture, Heroes in the Seaweed, from a line by Leonard Cohen, because I think it expresses very accurately the way to approach Keane's work. In his work, there is a celebration of the ordinary, of all of the joys, of all of the madnesses, of all of the hearts. With that in mind, I'm going to play another short clip for you, and I'm going to leave the last word to John B. Okay. Now, I would like to warn you that the audio quality on this clip isn't the best, so you may need to, to crank up your volume uh, if you can. Okay. So again, just, just try turn up your volume as high as you can because the quality on this isn't hectic. find out that I could write something marketable. Maybe 20 more years will pass before I can say to myself, you can write all right, you're okay, you're a writer. People will find it hard to understand this, but it isn't easy to become a writer. Nobody ever accepts a writer. He accepts himself. To be a writer, a real writer, you have to dream about it from the edge of reason onwards. You have to hold this thing into yourself, and you have to listen to taunts and jibes far removed from clinical criticism. You have to suffer punches from behind, delivered by unknown assailants. And you have to read and listen to things about yourself, which are far removed from the truth. You have to preach the gospel of charity to yourself. And you have to feel deeply for the hurt of other people. You have to hope that someday a budding, blossoming writer will come along and say, lads, lads, listen to this a minute. Listen to what this fellow wrote. And hope that one ear out of a tongue of people will later acknowledge and will see the comments made by writing better stuff in the same vein himself. I've always wanted to be a writer, to be accepted as a writer at any level. I have lived with other writers, not with their beings, but with their books, with their poems, with their plays and with their journalies. To me, writing matters because it's the noblest profession of all. It's the last of the free professions. And a man doesn't need matriculation to enter it. All he needs is hat, guts, courage, and never to be ashamed of himself or of his own people. A writer isn't a freak, a man to be watched or suspect. He's a human being with the finest of God's gifts at his disposal. He has the power to convey the great joys, great madnesses and great hurts in others. I am a kind of writer, and my ambition is that people will say sometime, he was a kind of writer. He sets up in things a different way from others. I did. 
So a kind of writer indeed. Um, so yeah, a kind of writer indeed. Um, so that's it from me, guys. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, I would just like to say, I, like, if anyone would like a transcript of this lecture, get in touch with Cara, and and I will I will pass it on. And um, so so I think Cara, do you want to? Open yeah.